Antidepressant Antidepressants are drugs used for the treatment of major depressive disorder and of other conditions, including some anxiety disorders, some chronic pain conditions, and to help manage some addictions. Typical side effects of antidepressants include dry mouth, weight gain, and lack of sex drive. Most types of antidepressants are typically safe to take, but may cause increased thoughts of suicide when taken by children, adolescents, and young adults. A discontinuation syndrome can occur after stopping any antidepressant. The risk is greater among those who have taken the medication for longer and when the medication in question has a short half-life. The problem usually begins within three days and may last for several months. Methods of prevention include gradually decreasing the dose among those who wish to stop, though it is possible for symptoms to occur with tapering. The most important classes of antidepressants are the plant St. John's word is also used in the treatment of depression. Bupropion, a NDRI, also operates as antidepressant. One theory regarding the cause of depression is that it is characterized by an overactive hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, HPA axis, that resembles the neuroendocrine response to stress. HPA axis abnormalities participate in the development of depressive symptoms, and antidepressants may serve to regulate the axis function. The medical community has long debated the effectiveness of antidepressants, concentrating on whether one can attribute observed results in patients' toth placebo effect. Antidepressants are used to treat major depressive disorder and of other conditions, including some anxiety disorders, some chronic pain conditions, and to help manage some addictions. Antidepressants are often used in combinations with one another. The UK National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE. 2009 guidelines indicate that antidepressants should not be routinely used for the initial treatment of mild depression, because the risk-benefit ratio is poor. The guidelines recommended that antidepressant treatment be considered for. The guidelines further note that antidepressant treatment should be used in combination with psychosocial interventions in most cases, should be continued for at least six months to reduce the risk of relapse, and that SSRIs are typically better tolerated than other antidepressants. American Psychiatric Association treatment guidelines recommend that initial treatment should be individually tailored based on factors that include severity of symptoms, coexisting disorders, prior treatment experience, and patient preference. Options may include pharmacotherapy, psychotherapy, electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, transcranial magnetic stimulation, TMS, or light therapy. They recommended antidepressant medication as an initial treatment choice in people with mild, moderate, or severe major depression, that should be given to all patients with severe depression unless ECT is planned. Conflicting results have arisen from studies analyzing the efficacy of antidepressants by comparisons to placebo in people with acute mild to moderate depression. Stronger evidence supports the usefulness of antidepressants in the treatment of depression that is chronic, dysthymia, or severe. A 2018 meta-analysis of trials found that in adults with major depressive disorder antidepressants were more efficacious than placebo effect sizes measured at 8 weeks after treatment onset were modest with a summary standard mean difference of 0.3. A 2018 meta-analysis of trials found that antidepressants showed little or no effect for treating depression and dementia. A 2017 meta-analysis comparing the efficacy of SSRIs against placebo found the mean reduction in Hamilton Depression Rating Scale, HDRS, to be minus 1.94 points over 49 studies. This was statistically significant, but failed to meet the clinical significance threshold, predefined according to the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence recommended standard mean difference of 0.5 equivalent to a three-point reduction in HDRS. A high risk of bias was found, which could possibly explain the statistically significant effect of SSRI, and the authors concluded that the frequency of adverse events outweighed the small clinical improvements. A 2015 systematic review of add-on therapies for treatment-resistant depression concluded that quetiapine and aripiprazole have the strongest evidence basis supporting their efficacy but they are associated with additional treatment-related side effects when used as an add-on therapy. In 2014 the U.S. FDA published a systematic review of all antidepressant maintenance trials submitted to the agency between 1985 and 2012. The authors concluded that maintenance treatment reduced the risk of relapse by 52% compared to placebo, and that this effect was primarily due to recurrent depression in the placebo group rather than a drug withdrawal effect. 
A 2012 meta-analysis found that fluoxetine and venlafaxine were effective for major depression in all age groups. The authors also found no evidence of a relationship between baseline severity of depression and degree of benefit of antidepressants over placebo. A review published in 2012 found a negative correlation between study year and efficacy of antidepressants as measured by response rate. The change in response rate was largely driven by increase in placebo response. However, the authors still concluded that antidepressants were effective in treating depression. The authors found that TCAs were the most effective drug, followed by SNRIs, MAOIs, SSRIs, and atypical antidepressants. The Cochrane Collaboration published a systematic review of clinical trials of the tricyclic antidepressant amitriptyline in 2012. The study concluded that in spite of moderate evidence for publication bias, there is strong evidence that the efficacy of amitriptyline is superior to placebo. The efficacy of paroxetine, Paxel, and amipramine was observed in a 2010 meta-analysis to be dependent upon the baseline severity, as measured by the HDRS antidepressants in patients with a score less than 23 indicating mild to moderate depression, demonstrated a small benefit over placebo. However, antidepressants in those with a score greater than 25 exhibited an advantage over placebo that crossed the NICE threshold for clinical significance. A review commissioned by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence that published in 2009 concluded that there is strong evidence that SSRIs have greater efficacy than placebo on achieving a 50% reduction in depression scores in moderate and severe major depression and that there is some evidence for a similar effect in mild depression. The treatment guidelines developed in conjunction with this review suggest that antidepressants should be considered in patients with moderate to severe depression and those with mild depression that is persistent or resistant to other treatment modalities. A 2008 Cochrane Collaboration Review on St. John's Wort, specifically, any extracts which contain Hypericum perforatum, and a 2015 meta-analytic systematic review by some of the same authors, both concluded that it has superior efficacy to placebo in treating depression, is as effective as standard antidepressant pharmaceuticals for treating depression, and has fewer adverse effects than other antidepressants. The 2015 meta-analysis concluded that it is difficult to assign a place for St. John's word in the treatment of depression owing to limitations in the available evidence base, including large variations in efficacy seen in trials performed in German-speaking relative to other countries. Reversible inhibitors of monoamine oxidase A, Remaz, have also been shown to be an effective drug therapy with greater tolerability than other antidepressants, however, the efficacy of SSRIs, tricyclic, and tetracyclic antidepressants in treating depression is supported by a much larger evidence base compared to other antidepressant drug therapies, i.e., St. John's Wort, Remau inhibitors, serotonin norepinephrine uptake inhibitor, serotonin antagonist and reuptake inhibitors, noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors, and noradrenergic and specific serotonergic antidepressants. In a 2008 publication, Irving Kirsch and Thomas Moore concluded that the overall effect of new generation antidepressant medication is below recommended criteria for clinical significance. This updated work they had first published in 2002 in which they stated that the evidence is most consistent a role as active placebos. A 2004 review concluded that antidepressant studies that failed to support efficacy claims were dramatically less likely to be published than those that did support favorable efficacy claims. Similar results were obtained for a study of publication of clinical trials of antidepressants in children. A 2015 investigation of meta analyses of antidepressant studies found that 79% of them had sponsorship or authors who were pharmaceutical, industry employees, and or had conflicts of interest. A study published in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, in 2002 demonstrated that the magnitude of the placebo effect in clinical trials of depression have been growing over time while the effect size of tested drugs has remained relatively constant. The authors suggest that one possible explanation for the growing placebo effect in clinical trials is the inclusion of larger number of participants with shorter term, mild, or spontaneously remitting depression as a result of decreasing stigma associated with antidepressant use. Placebo response rates in clinical trials of complementary and alternative, CAM, therapies are significantly lower than those in clinical trials of traditional antidepressants. The largest and most expensive study conducted to date, on the effectiveness of pharmacological treatment for depression, was commissioned by the National Institute of Mental Health. This study was dubbed the Sequence Treatment Alternatives to Relieve Depression, STAR-D, 
Study. The results are summarized here. Participants in the trial were recruited when they sought medical care at general medical or psychiatric clinics. No advertising was used to recruit subjects in order to maximize the generalizability of the study results. Participants were required to have a minimum score of 14 points on the Hamilton Depression Scale, HAMD 17, in order to be enrolled in the trial. Generally accepted cutoffs are 7 to 17 points for mild depression, 18 to 24 points for moderate depression, and greater than or equal to 24 for severe depression. The average participant baseline HAMD 17 score was 22. The pre-specified primary endpoint of this trial was remission as determined by the HAMD score, with all patients with missing scores rated as non-responders. In the aftermath of the trial, the investigators have presented the results mainly using the secondary endpoint of remission according to the KIDS SR16 score, which tend to be somewhat higher. There were no statistical or meaningful clinical differences in remission rates, response rates, or times to remission or response among any of the medications compared in the study. These included bupropion sustained release, bupropion, citalopram, lithium, mirtazapine, nortriptyline, sertraline, triiodothyronine, tranylcypramine, and venlafaxine extended release. A 2008 review of randomized controlled trials concluded that symptomatic improvement with SSRIs was greatest by the end of the first week of use, but that some improvement continued for at least six weeks. Between 30% and 50% of individuals treated with a given antidepressant do not show a response. In clinical studies, approximately one-third of patients achieve a full remission, one-third experience a response and one-third are non-responders. Partial remission is characterized by the presence of poorly defined residual symptoms. These symptoms typically include depressed mood, psychic anxiety, sleep disturbance, fatigue and diminished interest or pleasure. It is currently unclear which factors predict partial remission. However, it is clear that residual symptoms are powerful predictors of relapse, with relapse rates three to six times higher in patients with residual symptoms than in those who experience full remission. In addition, antidepressant drugs tend to lose efficacy over the course of treatment. According to data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Less than one-third of Americans taking on antidepressant medication have seen a mental health professional in the previous year. A number of strategies are used in clinical practice to try to overcome these limits and variations. They include switching medication, augmentation, and combination. The American Psychiatric Association 2000 Practice Guideline advises that where no response is achieved following six to eight weeks of treatment with an antidepressant, to switch to an antidepressant in the same class, then to a different class of antidepressant. A 2006 meta analysis review found wide variation in the findings of prior studies for patients who had failed to respond to an SSRI antidepressant, between 12% and 86% showed a response to a new drug. However, the more antidepressants an individual had already tried, the less likely they were to benefit from a new antidepressant trial. However, a later meta analysis found no difference between switching to a new drug and staying on the old medication. Although 34% of treatment-resistant patients responded when switched to the new drug, 40% responded without being switched. For a partial response, the American Psychiatric Association guidelines suggest augmentation, or adding a drug from a different class. These include lithium and thyroid augmentation, dopamine agonists, sex steroids, NRIs, glucocorticoid-specific agents, or the newer anticonvulsants. A combination strategy involves adding another antidepressant, usually from a different class so as to have effect on other mechanisms. Although this may be used in clinical practice, there is little evidence for the relative efficacy or adverse effects of this strategy. Other tests recently conducted include the use of psychostimulants as an augmentation therapy. Several studies have shown the efficacy of combining modafinil to treatment resistant patients. It has been used to help combat SSRI associated fatigue. The therapeutic effects of antidepressants typically do not continue once the course of medication ends. This results in a high rate of relapse. A 2003 meta analysis of 31 placebo controlled antidepressant trials, mostly limited to studies covering a period of one year, found that 18% of patients who had responded to an antidepressant relapsed while still taking it, compared to 41% whose antidepressant was switched for a placebo. A gradual loss of therapeutic benefit occurs in a minority of people during the course of treatment. A strategy involving the use of pharmacotherapy in the treatment of the acute episode, 
followed by psychotherapy in its residual phase, has been suggested by some studies. Antidepressants are recommended by the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE, for the treatment of generalized anxiety disorder, GAD. FOP has failed to respond to conservative measures such as education and self-help activities. GAD is a common disorder of which the central feature is excessive worry about a number of different events. Key symptoms include excessive anxiety about multiple events and issues, and difficulty controlling worrisome thoughts that persists for at least six months. Antidepressants provide a modest to moderate reduction in anxiety in GAD, and are superior to placebo in treating GAD. The efficacy of different antidepressants is similar. SSRIs are a second-line treatment of adult obsessive-compulsive disorder, OCD, with mild functional impairment and is first-line treatment for those with moderate or severe impairment. In children, SSRIs can be considered as a second-line therapy in those with moderate to severe impairment, with close monitoring for psychiatric adverse effects. SSRIs are efficacious in the treatment of OCD. Patients treated with SSRIs are about twice as likely to respond to treatment as those treated with placebo. Efficacy has been demonstrated both in short-term treatment trials of 6 to 24 weeks and in discontinuation trials of 28 to 52 weeks duration. Antidepressants are recommended as an alternative or additional first step to self-help programs in the treatment of bulimia nervosa. SSRIs, fluoxetine in particular, are preferred over other antidepressants due to their acceptability, tolerability, and superior reduction of symptoms in short-term trials. Long-term efficacy remains poorly characterized. Bupropion is not recommended for the treatment of eating disorders due to an increased risk of seizure. Similar recommendations apply to binge eating disorder. SSRIs provide short-term reductions in binge eating behavior, but have not been associated with significant weight loss. Clinical trials have generated mostly negative results for the use of SSRIs in the treatment of anorexia nervosa. Treatment guidelines from the National Institute of Health and Care Excellence recommend against the use of SSRIs in this disorder. Those from the American Psychiatric Association note that SSRIs confer no advantage regarding weight gain, but that they may be used for the treatment of coexisting depressive, anxiety, or obsessive-compulsive disorders. A 2012 meta-analysis concluded that antidepressants treatment favorably affects pain, health-related quality of life, depression and sleep and fibromyalgia syndrome. Tricyclics appear to be the most effective class, with moderate effects on pain and sleep and small effects on fatigue and health-related quality of life. The fraction of people experiencing a 30% pain reduction on tricyclics was 48% versus 28% for placebo. For SSRIs and SNRIs the fraction of people experiencing a 30% pain reduction was 36%, 20% in the placebo comparator arms, and 42%. 32% in the corresponding placebo comparator arms. Discontinuation of treatment due to side effects was common. Antidepressants including amitriptyline, fluoxetine, duloxetine, milnasopran, meclobemide, and pyrolindol are recommended by the European League Against Rheumatism, ULER, for the treatment of fibromyalgia based on limited evidence. A 2014 meta-analysis from the Cochrane Collaboration found the antidepressant duloxetine to be effective for the treatment of pain resulting from diabetic neuropathy. The same group reviewed data for amitriptyline in the treatment of neuropathic pain and found limited useful randomized clinical trial data. They concluded that the long history of successful use in the community for the treatment of fibromyalgia and neuropathic pain justified its continued use. The group was concerned about the potential for overestimating the amount of pain relief provided by amitriptyline, and highlighted that only a small number of people will experience significant pain relief by taking this medication. Antidepressants may be modestly helpful for treating people who both have depression and alcohol dependence, however the evidence supporting this association of low quality. Bupropion is used to help people stop smoking. Difficulty tolerating adverse effects is the most common reason for antidepressant discontinuation. Almost any medication involved with serotonin regulation has the potential to cause serotonin toxicity, also known as serotonin syndrome an excess of serotonin that can induce mania, restlessness, agitation, emotional ability, insomnia and confusion as its primary symptoms. Although the condition is serious, it is not particularly common, generally only appearing at high doses or while on other medications. Assuming proper medical intervention has been taken, within about 24 hours, it is rarely fatal.
fatal, MAOIs tend to have pronounced, sometimes fatal, interactions with a wide variety of medications and over-the-counter drugs. If taken with foods that contain very high levels of tyramine, for example, mature cheese, cured meats, or yeast extracts, they may cause a potentially lethal hypertensive crisis. At lower doses the person may be bothered by only a headache due to an increase in blood pressure. In response to these adverse effects, a different type of MAOI has been developed, the reversible inhibitor of monoamine oxidase A, RIMA, class of drugs. Their primary advantage is that they do not require the person to follow a special diet, while being purportedly effective as SSRIs and tricyclics in treating depressive disorders. SSRI use in pregnancy has been associated with a variety of risks with varying degrees of proof of causation. As depression is independently associated with negative pregnancy outcomes, determining the extent to which observed associations between antidepressant use and specific adverse outcomes reflects a causative relationship has been difficult in some cases. In other cases, the attribution of adverse outcomes to antidepressant exposure seems fairly clear. SSRI use in pregnancy is associated with an increased risk of spontaneous abortion of about 1.7 fold, and is associated with preterm birth and low birth weight. A systematic review of the risk of major birth defects in antidepressant exposed pregnancies found a small increase, 3% to 24%, in the risk of major malformations and a risk of cardiovascular birth defects that did not differ from non exposed pregnancies. A study of fluoxetine exposed pregnancies found a 12% increase in the risk of major malformations that just missed statistical significance. Other studies have found an increased risk of cardiovascular birth defects among depressed mothers not undergoing SSRI treatment, suggesting the possibility of ascertainment bias, for example that worried mothers may pursue more aggressive testing of their infants. Another study found no increase in cardiovascular birth defects and a 27% increased risk of major malformations in SSRI exposed pregnancies. The FDA advises for the risk of birth defects with the use of paroxetine and the MAOI should be avoided. A 2013 systematic review and meta-analysis found that antidepressant use during pregnancy was statistically significantly associated with some pregnancy outcomes, such as gestational age and preterm birth, but not with other outcomes. The same review cautioned that because differences between the exposed and unexposed groups were small, it was doubtful whether they were clinically significant. A neonate, infant less than 28 days old may experience a withdrawal syndrome from abrupt discontinuation of the antidepressant at birth. Antidepressants have been shown to be present in varying amounts in breast milk, but their effects on infants are currently unknown. Moreover, SSRIs inhibit nitric oxide synthesis, which plays an important role in setting vascular tone. Several studies have pointed to an increased risk of prematurity associated with SSRI use, and this association may be due to an increased risk of preeclampsia of pregnancy. Another possible problem with antidepressants is the chance of antidepressant-induced mania or hypomania in patients with or without a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. Many cases of bipolar depression are very similar to those of unipolar depression. Therefore, the patient can be misdiagnosed with unipolar depression and be given antidepressants. Studies have shown that antidepressant-induced mania can occur in 20 to 40 percent of bipolar patients. For bipolar depression, antidepressants, most frequently SSRIs, can exacerbate or trigger symptoms of hypomania and mania. Studies have shown that the use of antidepressants is correlated with an increased risk of suicidal behavior and thinking, suicidality, in those aged under 25. This problem has been serious enough to warrant government intervention by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. FDA, to warn of the increased risk of suicidality during antidepressant treatment. According to the FDA, the heightened risk of suicidality is within the first one to two months of treatment. The National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, NICE, places the excess risk in the early stages of treatment. A meta analysis suggests that the relationship between antidepressant use and suicidal behavior or thoughts is age dependent. Compared to placebo, the use of antidepressants is associated with an increase in suicidal behavior or thoughts among those aged under 25, or equals 1.62. This increase in suicidality approaches that observed in children and adolescents. There is no effect or possibly a mild protective effect among those aged 25 to 64, or equals 0.79. Antidepressant treatment has a protective effect against suicidality among those aged 65 and over, or equals 0.37.
Often, sexual side effects are also common with SSRIs, such as loss of sexual drive, failure to reach orgasm, and erectile dysfunction. Although usually reversible, these sexual side effects can, in rare cases, last for months or years after the drug has been completely withdrawn. In a study of 1,022 outpatients, overall sexual dysfunction with all antidepressants averaged 59.1% with SSRIs values between 57 and 73%, mirtazapine 24%, nifazidone 8%, aminepton 7% and meclobemide 4%. Meclobemide, a selective reversible MAO-A inhibitor, does not cause sexual dysfunction, and can actually lead to an improvement in all aspects of sexual function. Biochemical mechanisms suggested as causative include increased serotonin, particularly affecting 5 height and 5 height receptors, decreased dopamine, decreased norepinephrine, blockade of cholinergic and alpha adrenergic receptors, inhibition of nitric oxide synthetase, and elevation of prolactin levels. Mirtazapine is reported to have fewer sexual side effects, most likely because it antagonizes 5 height and 5 height receptors and may, in some cases, Reverse sexual dysfunction induced by SSRIs by the same mechanism. Bupropion, a weak NDRI and nicotinic antagonist, may be useful in treating reduced libido as a result of SSRI treatment. Changes in appetite or weight are common among antidepressants, but largely drug dependent and are related to which neurotransmitters they affect. Mirtazapine and paroxetine, for example, have the effect of weight gain and/or increased appetite, while others such as bupropion and venlafaxine, achieve a opposite effect. The antihistaminic properties of certain TCA and TCA class antidepressants have been shown to contribute to the common side effects of increased appetite and weight gain associated with these classes of medication. Antidepressant discontinuation syndrome, also called antidepressant withdrawal syndrome, is a condition that can occur following the interruption, reduction, or discontinuation of antidepressant medication. The symptoms may include flu-like symptoms, trouble sleeping, nausea, poor balance, sensory changes, and anxiety. The problem usually begins within three days and may last for several months. Rarely psychosis may occur. A discontinuation syndrome can occur after stopping any antidepressant including selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, and tricyclic antidepressants, TCAs. The risk is greater among those who have taken the medication for longer and when the medication in question has a short half-life. The underlying reason for its occurrence is unclear. The diagnosis is based on the symptoms. Methods of prevention include gradually decreasing the dose among those who wish to stop, though it is possible for symptoms to occur with tapering. Treatment may include restarting the medication and slowly decreasing the dose. People may also be switched to the long-acting antidepressant fluxetine which can then be gradually decreased. Approximately 20 to 50 percent of people who suddenly stop an antidepressant develop an antidepressant discontinuation syndrome. The condition is generally not serious, though about half of people with symptoms describe them as severe. Some restart antidepressants due to the severity of the symptoms. SSRIs appear to cause emotional blunting, or numbness in some people who take them. This is a reduction in extremes of emotion, both positive and negative. While the person may feel less depressed, they may also feel less happiness or empathy in some situations. This may be cause for a dose reduction or medication change. The exact mechanism is unknown. The earliest and probably most widely accepted scientific theory of antidepressant action is the monoamine hypothesis, which can be traced back to the 1950s, which states that depression is due to an imbalance most often a deficiency, of the monoamine neurotransmitters, namely serotonin, norepinephrine and dopamine. It was originally proposed based on the observation that certain hydrazine anti-tuberculosis agents produce antidepressant effects, which was later linked to their inhibitory effects on monoamine oxidase, the enzyme that catalyzes the breakdown of the monoamine neurotransmitters. All currently marketed antidepressants have a monoamine hypothesis as their theoretical basis with a possible exception of agamelatin which acts on a dual melatonergic serotonergic pathway. Despite the success of the monoamine hypothesis it has a number of limitations, for one, all monoaminergic antidepressants shave a delayed onset of action of at least a week, and secondly, there are a sizable portion, greater than 40%, of depressed patients that do not adequately respond to monoaminergic antidepressants. 
A number of alternative hypotheses have been proposed, including the glutamate, neurogenic, epigenetic, cortisol hypersecretion and inflammatory hypotheses. Selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, are believed to increase the extracellular level of the neurotransmitter serotonin by limiting its reabsorption into the presynaptic cell, increasing the level of serotonin in the synaptic cleft available to bind to the postsynaptic receptor. They have varying degrees of selectivity for the other monoamine transporters, with pure SSRIs having only weak affinity for the norepinephrine and dopamine transporters. SSRIs are the most widely prescribed antidepressants in many countries. The efficacy of SSRIs in mild or moderate cases of depression has been disputed. Citalopram acetalopram is a widely known SSRI medication. Serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, are potent inhibitors of the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. These neurotransmitters are known to play an important role in mood. SNRIs can be contrasted with the more widely used selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors SSRIs, which act mostly upon serotonin alone. The human serotonin transporter, SERT, and norepinephrine transporter, NET, are membrane proteins that are responsible for the reuptake of serotonin and norepinephrine. Balanced dual inhibition of monoamine reuptake can possibly offer advantages over other antidepressants drugs by treating a wider range of symptoms. SNRIs are sometimes also used to treat anxiety disorders, obsessive-compulsive disorder, OCD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, chronic neuropathic pain, and fibromyalgia syndrome, FMS, and for the relief of menopausal symptoms. Serotonin modulator and stimulators, SMSs, sometimes referred to more simply as serotonin modulators, are a type of drug with a multimodal action specific to the serotonin neurotransmitter system. To be precise, SMSs simultaneously modulate one or more serotonin receptors and inhibit the reuptake of serotonin. The term was created to describe the mechanism of action of the serotonergic antidepressant vortioxetine, which acts as a serotonin reuptake inhibitor, SRI, partial agonist of the 5 height receptor, and antagonist of the 5 height and 5 height receptors. However, it can also technically be applied to velazidone, which is an antidepressant as well and acts as an SRI and 5 height receptor partial agonist. An alternative term is serotonin partial agonist slash reuptake inhibitor, SPARI, which can be applied only to velazidone. Serotonin antagonist and reuptake inhibitors, SARIs, while mainly used as antidepressants, are also anxiolytics and hypnotic stop they act by antagonizing serotonin receptors such as 5 height and inhibiting the reuptake of serotonin, norepinephrine, and or dopamine. Additionally, most also act as alpha adrenergic receptor antagonists. The majority of the currently marketed SARIs belong to the phenylpiperzine class of compounds. They include trazodone and nefazodone. Norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, NRIs or NARIs, are a type of drug that acts as a reuptake inhibitor for the neurotransmitter norepinephrine, noradrenaline by blocking the action of the norepinephrine transporter, NET. This in turn leads to increased extracellular concentrations of norepinephrine. NRIs are commonly used in the treatment of conditions like ADHD and narcolepsy due to their psychostimulant effects and in obesity due to their appetite suppressant effects. They are also frequently used as antidepressants for the treatment of major depressive disorder, anxiety and panic disorder. Additionally, many drugs of abuse such as cocaine and methylphenidate possess NRI activity, though it is important to mention that NRIs without combined dopamine reuptake inhibitor, DRI, properties are not significantly rewarding and hence are considered to have a negligible abuse potential. However, Norepinephrine has been implicated as acting synergistically with dopamine when actions on the two neurotransmitters are combined, for example, in the case of NDRIs, to produce rewarding effects in psychostimulant drugs of abuse. The only drug used of this class for depression is bupropion. The majority of the tricyclic antidepressants, TCAs, act primarily as serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, by blocking the serotonin transporter certain the norepinephrine transporter. NET, respectively, which results in an elevation of the synaptic concentrations of these neurotransmitters, and therefore an enhancement of neurotransmission. Notably, with the sole exception of amineptin, the TCAs have negligible affinity for the dopamine transporter DAT, and therefore have no efficacy as dopamine reuptake inhibitors, DRIs.
effects. Although TCAs are sometimes prescribed for depressive disorders, they have been largely replaced in clinical use in most parts of the world by newer antidepressants such as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSRIs, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, SNRIs, and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors, NRIS. Adverse effects have been found to be of a similar level between TCAs and SSRIs. Tetracyclic antidepressants, TECAs, are a class of antidepressants that were first introduced in the 1970s. They are named after their chemical structure, which contains four rings of atoms, and are closely related to the tricyclic antidepressants, TCAs, which contain three rings of atoms. Minoamine oxidase inhibitors, MAOIs, are chemicals which inhibit the activity of the minoamine oxidase enzyme family. They have a long history of use as medications prescribed for the treatment of depression. They are particularly effective in treating atypical depression. They are also used in the treatment of Parkinson's disease and several other disorders. Because of potentially lethal dietary and drug interactions, minoamine oxidase inhibitors have historically been reserved as a last line of treatment used only when other classes of antidepressant drugs, for example selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and tricyclic antidepressants, have failed. MAOIs have been found to be effective in the treatment of panic disorder with agoraphobia, social phobia, atypical depression or mixed anxiety and depression, bulimia, and post-traumatic stress disorder, as well as borderline personality disorder. MAOIs appear to be particularly effective in the management of bipolar depression according to a recent retrospective analysis. There are reports of MAOI efficacy in obsessive-compulsive disorder, OCD, trichotillomania, dysmorphophobia, and avoidant personality disorder, but these reports are from uncontrolled case reports. MAOIs can also be used in the treatment of Parkinson's disease by targeting MAUBI in particular therefore affecting dopaminergic neurons, as well as providing an alternative for migraine prophylaxis. Inhibition of both MAO-A and MAO-B is used in the treatment of clinical depression and anxiety disorders. See the list of antidepressants for other drugs which are not specifically characterized. Adjunct medications are an umbrella term used to describe substances that increase the potency or enhance antidepressants. They work by affecting variables very close to the antidepressant sometimes affecting a completely different mechanism of action. This may be attempted when depression treatments have not been successful in the past. Common types of adjunct medication techniques generally fall into the following categories. It is unknown if undergoing psychological therapy at the same time as taking antidepressants enhances the antidepressive effect of the medication. Lithium has been used to augment antidepressant therapy in those who have failed to respond to antidepressants alone. Furthermore, Lithium dramatically decreases the suicide risk in recurrent depression. There is some evidence for the addition of a thyroid hormone, triiodothyronine, in patients with normal thyroid function. Psychopharmacologists have also tried adding a stimulant, in particular, deamphetamine. However, the use of stimulants in cases of treatment-resistant depression is relatively controversial. A review article published in 2007 found psychostimulants may be effective in treatment-resistant depression with concomitant antidepressant therapy, but a more certain conclusion could not be drawn due to substantial deficiencies in the studies available for consideration, and the somewhat contradictory nature of their results. Before the 1950s, opioids and amphetamines were commonly used as antidepressants. Their use was later restricted due to their addictive nature and side effects. Extracts from the herb St. John's Word have been used as a nerve tonic to alleviate depression. In 1951, Irving Selikoff and, working out of Seaview Hospital on Staten Island, began clinical trials on two new anti-tuberculosis agents developed by Hoffman La Roche, isoniazid and iperniazid. Only patients with a poor prognosis were initially treated, nevertheless, their condition improved dramatically. Selikoff and Robitsik noted a subtle general stimulation. The patients exhibited renewed vigor and indeed this occasionally served to introduce disciplinary problems. The promise of a cure for tuberculosis in the Seaview Hospital trials was excitedly discussed in the mainstream press. In 1952, learning of the stimulating side effects of isoniazid, the Cincinnati psychiatrist Max Lurie tried it on his patients. In the following year, he and Harry Salser reported that isoniazid improved depression in two-thirds of their patients and coined the term antidepressant to describe its action. A similar incident took place in Paris, where Jean Delay, head of psychiatry at St. Anne Hospital, 
heard of this effect from his pulmonology colleagues at Cochin Hospital. In 1952, before Lurian Salzer, delay, with a resident, reported the positive effect of isoniazid on depressed patients. The mode of antidepressant action of isoniazid is still unclear. It is speculated that its effect is due to the inhibition of diamine oxidase, coupled with a weak inhibition of monoamine oxidase A. Selikoff and Robitzik also experimented with another anti-tuberculosis drug, Ipraniazid. It showed a greater psychostimulant defect, but more pronounced toxicity. Later, Jackson Smith, Gordon Kamon, George E. Crane, and Frank Haid, described the psychiatric applications of Ipraniazid. Ernst Seller found Ipraniazid to be a potent monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Nevertheless, Ipraniazid remained relatively obscure until Nathan S. Klein, the influential head of research at Rockland State Hospital, began to popularize it in the medical and popular press as a psychic energizer. Roche put a significant marketing effort behind Ipraniazid. Its sales grew until it was recalled in 1961, due to reports of lethal hepatotoxicity. The antidepressant effect of a tricyclic, a three-ringed compound, was first discovered in 1957 by Roland Kuhn in a Swiss psychiatric hospital. Antihistamine derivatives were used to treat surgical shock and later as neuroleptics. Although in 1955 resipine was shown to be more effective than placebo in alleviating anxious depression, neuroleptics were being developed as sedatives and antipsychotics. Attempting to improve the effectiveness of chlorpromazine, Kuhn in conjunction with the Geigy Pharmaceutical Company discovered the compound G22355, later renamed amipramine. Amipramine had a beneficial effect in patients with depression who showed mental and motor retardation. Kuhn described his new compound as a thymoleptic taking hold of the emotions, in contrast with neuroleptics, taking hold of the nerves in 1955-56. These gradually became established, resulting in the patent and manufacture in the U.S. in 1951 by Hofliger and Skandra. Antidepressants became prescription drugs in the 1950s. It was estimated that no more than 50 to 100 individuals per million suffered from the kind of depression hat these new drugs would treat, and pharmaceutical companies were not enthusiastic in marketing for this small market. Sales through the 1960s remain poor compared to the sales of tranquilizers, which were being marketed for different uses. Amipramine remained in common use and numerous successors were introduced. The use of monoamine oxidase inhibitors, MAOI. Increased after the development and introduction of reversible forms affecting only the MAO-A subtype of inhibitors, making this drug safer to use. By the 1960s, it was thought that the mode of action of tricyclics was to inhibit norepinephrine reuptake. However, norepinephrine reuptake became associated with stimulating effects. Later tricyclics were thought to affect serotonin as proposed in 1969 by Carlson and Lindqvist as well as Lapin and Oxenkrug. Researchers began a process of rational drug design to isolate antihistamine-derived compounds that would selectively target these systems. The first such compound to be patented was Synlidine in 1971, while the first released clinically was Indalpine. Fluoxetine was approved for commercial use by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration (FDA) in 1988, becoming the first blockbuster SSRI. Fluoxetine was developed at Eli Lilly and Company in the early 1970s by Brian Malloy, Klaus Schmiegel, David T. Wong and others. SSRIs became known as novel antidepressants along with other newer drugs such as SNRIs and NRIs with various selective effects. St. John's word fell out of favor in most countries through the 19th and 20th centuries, except in Germany, where hypericum extracts were eventually licensed, packaged and prescribed. Small-scale efficacy trials were carried out in the 1970s and 1980s, and attention grew in the 1990s following a meta-analysis. It remains an over-the-counter drug (OTC) supplement in most countries. Research continues to investigate its active component hyperforin and to further understand its mode of action. In the United States, antidepressants were the most commonly prescribed medication in 2013. Of the estimated 16 million long-term over 24 months, users, roughly 70% are female. In the UK, figures reported in 2010 indicated that the number of antidepressants prescribed by the National Health Service, NHS, almost doubled over a decade. Further analysis published in 2014 showed that number of antidepressants dispensed annually in the community went up by 25 million in the 14 years between 1998 and 2012, rising from 15 million to 40 million. 
Nearly 50% of this rise occurred in the four years after the 2008 banking crash, during which time the annual increase in prescriptions rose from 6.7% to 8.5%. These sources also suggest that aside from the recession, other factors that may influence changes in prescribing grades may include, improvements in diagnosis, a reduction of the stigma surrounding mental health, broader prescribing trends, GP characteristics, geographical location and housing status. Another factor that may contribute to increasing consumption of antidepressants is the fact that these medications now are used for other conditions including social anxiety and post-traumatic stress. United States, the most commonly prescribed antidepressants in the U.S. retail market in 2010 were Netherlands, in the Netherlands, paroxetine, marketed as Ciroxat among generic preparations, is the most prescribed antidepressant, followed by amitriptyline, citalopram and venlafaxine. As of 2003, worldwide, 30 to 60 percent of people didn't follow their practitioner's instructions about taking their antidepressants, and as of 2013 in the U.S., it appeared that around 50 percent of people did not take their antidepressants as directed by their practitioner. When people fail to take their antidepressants, there is a greater risk that the drug won't help, that symptoms get worse, that they miss work or are less productive eat work, and that the person may be hospitalized. This also increases costs for caring for them. In looking at the issue of antidepressant use, some academics have highlighted the need to examine the use of antidepressants and other medical treatments in cross-cultural terms, due to the fact that various cultures prescribe and observe different manifestations, symptoms, meanings and associations of depression and other medical conditions within their populations. These cross-cultural discrepancies, it has been argued, then have implications on the perceived efficacy and use of antidepressants and other strategies in the treatment of depression in these different cultures. In India antidepressants are largely seen as tools to combat marginality, promising the individual the ability to reintegrate into society through their use, a view and association not observed in the West. Because most antidepressants function by inhibiting the reuptake of neurotransmitters serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine these drugs can interfere with natural neurotransmitter levels in other organisms impacted by indirect exposure. Antidepressants fluoxetine and sertraline have been detected in aquatic organisms residing in effluent-dominated streams. The presence of antidepressants in surface waters and aquatic organisms has caused concern because ecotoxicological effects to aquatic organisms due to fluoxetine exposure have been demonstrated. Coral reef fish have been demonstrated to modulate aggressive behavior through serotonin. Artificially increasing serotonin levels in crustaceans can temporarily reverse social status and turn subordinates into aggressive and territorial dominant males. Exposure to fluoxetine has been demonstrated to increase serotonergic activity in fish, subsequently reducing aggressive behavior. Perinatal exposure to fluoxetine at relevant environmental concentrations has been shown to lead to significant modifications of memory processing in one month old cuttlefish. This impairment may disadvantage cuttlefish and decrease their survival. Somewhat less than 10% of orally administered fluoxetine is excreted from humans unchanged or as glucuronide. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.